Not with that man. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Susan Meffert. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at UCSF. I'll be the moderator for the panel today. Um, personally, I conduct capacity building research on adult depression and anxiety disorders in low and middle income countries. And I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating this panel today. You have in front of you just uh, the luminaries and in my mind the uh, some of the rock stars of global mental health here. We are so lucky to have them all in one place. Um, these are the people who have shown a bright light on global mental health and its importance in the world, in the field of global health, um, recognizing the massive disability that it inflicts upon the world and also the ones leading the charge and getting the attention uh, that it deserves. First, I'll give you just a brief, a few brief introductions on our panelists today, and then I'll turn it over to them. We have, speaking first, Dr. Vikram Patel. He's professor of international mental health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he's co-founder of the Center for Global Mental Health, as well as the NGO Sangath in Goa, India. Dr. Patel, he's been a powerful advocate for global mental health for many years. He has a roster of key policy, educational, and research contributions. And he was an editor on the mental health section of the DCP3. He'll be presenting its findings and its implications for the, for the field today. Dr. Maria Elena Medina Mora is the general director of the National Institute of Psychiatry, Ramon de la Fuente in Mexico. Dr. Medina Mora is a researcher at the National Institutes of Health and a member of the National System of Researchers in Mexico. She was also an editor on the Disease Control Priorities section on mental health, and she'll be presenting today on the interventions recommended. Dr. Carly Silver is Vice President of Programs for Grand Challenges Canada, and she's substituting for Dr. Peter Singer today. Dr. Silver leads the stars in global health, saving lives at birth, saving brains and global mental health programs. She will discuss key GCC Grand Challenges Canada projects as examples of those advancing the field of global mental health. Finally, Dr. Pamela Collins is Associate Director for Special Populations and Director of the Office of Research on Disparities in Global Mental Health at the National Institutes of Mental Health. She will present today on the role of universities and funders in advancing the field. Because we have just a few minutes for each person, person to speak, I'm gonna ask that you hold your questions until the end, and we have a, a good block of time, about 30 minutes or so, allotted for questions at the end. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Patel now. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming for this session. Uh, uh, I want to start by just acknowledging what a rare pleasure it is for me to be the only man on a panel uh, in global health. This is not something you'll frequently see in conferences. So uh, uh, it's also a terrific sign of how gender fair this particular field of global mental health is. Um, the presentations today really are in two different parts. Uh, the first part that Maria Elena and I will do will be specifically about the disease control uh, priorities project. Um, and then that will follow on from, with Carly and Pamela, where they will talk about the specific work that their uh, organizations are supporting in this sector. 
So for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the Disease Control Priorities Project, this is, uh, we're currently in the third edition of this project. The uh, uh, project was really launched in its first edition as the World Development Report by the World Bank. And I think it was a very important moment in global health, uh, the history of global health, because this was the first time uh, that the World Bank and economists took a particular interest in the area of health uh, as an economic priority. This was followed uh, by the DCP2 in 2006, which really focused primarily on the cost effectiveness of specific interventions for a range of different health conditions. Uh, and we're currently in the rollout of DCP3, uh, which is being done in specific stages of which mental health is one. Now, the specific goals of DCP3, like its predecessors, uh, it really is to synthesize evidence primarily focusing on the needs uh, of policymakers, particularly ministers of finance and ministers of health. And there's a, an important assumption that really underlies this priority setting, and that is that resources are constrained or limited, uh, and therefore uh, policymakers need information on how best to use the scarce money that they have at their disposal. Now, some of us may disagree with the notion that resources are constrained, but anyway, that is a starting point of much of the kind of work uh, that DCP3 does. So the DCP3 enterprise also advances the agenda of economic evaluation in many, in many significant ways, particularly really also contributing to our understanding of uh, financial risk protection uh, uh, that is consequent to investment in healthcare interventions. And of course, that's extremely relevant uh, in the era of universal health coverage. As you can see from this slide, there are nine volumes of DCP3, of which uh, uh, the one that we will briefly review today uh, is the fourth one on mental, neurological, and substance use conditions. Uh, the ninth volume is quite an important one. Uh, later on today, there will be a meeting in which uh, an essential package of interventions uh, derived from the other eight disease-specific volumes will be, uh, will be distilled. Um, and that will be a set of interventions that will then be recommended uh, to governments uh, as essential uh, uh, healthcare interventions to be scaled up. The volume that I led along with Maria Lena and several other editors have involved contributions from more than 50 authors from more than 14 countries. And in fact, the official launch, which is supposed to be today, has in fact been postponed to day after tomorrow um, in Washington, D.C., where uh, the launch will happen in the World Bank uh, at a very special meeting that the World Bank President, uh, Dr. Jim Kim, is co-hosting with the Director General of the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Margaret Chan, uh, to promote uh, mental health uh, um, as an economic priority. And I think it's quite a momentous week, really, for mental health, because uh, the meeting a day after tomorrow isn't a health meeting. It's actually the World Bank spring meeting uh, in which um, the primary audience are ministers of finance uh, from around the world. Uh, this particular area of the so-called brain and mind disorders really captures a very diverse, heterogeneous group of conditions. And we did struggle quite a lot with really how we would organize these conditions. And even within this organizing structure that you see here, there is a very large number of different types of specific conditions. So we were really primarily guided by the burden of disease. We selected those conditions uh, which contributed uh, the most to the burden of disease within each of these five broad categories of health conditions. And you can also see an injury-related uh, condition at the end, suicide and self-harm, that was also included in our volume, of course, for obvious reasons, because uh, the majority of people who attempt suicide or harm themselves have a mental health problem. As with all the other DCP3 volumes, uh, and uh, just to say that you can actually get the DCP3 volume for free uh, from the DCP3 website uh, as a soft copy, uh, the, all the DCP3 vo uh, volumes have followed a very similar organizing structure, as you can see on this slide, making the case uh, as to why these conditions are a public health priority by focusing on the burden of disease, examining the evidence both of effectiveness and cost effectiveness of interventions for prevention, treatment, and care, uh, but perhaps more importantly, not just ending with interventions, but also examining what are the most appropriate delivery channels or platforms for their delivery. And finally, the economic piece uh, on the costing and the impact uh, in terms of financial risk protection. I want to tell you some headline findings about the burden of disease uh, 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 that we present in this volume. Uh, we really utilize primarily the global burden of disease database, but we did do a number of new analyses that I'll briefly show you in the next few slides. 
The first important headline finding is the rising proportion of the global burden of disease that is attributable to mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. As you can see on this slide, which shows the ranking of different groups of health conditions uh, in 1990 and 2013, and you can see uh, an increase in the ranking of both mental and substance use disorders as well as neurological disorders. And of course, this is uh, the burden of disease estimated on the basis of the metric of the DALI. This, the most important contribution to the burden of disease actually happens in terms of years lived with disability. As you'll see in a moment, the actual years of life lost that are attributable to mental disorders in the global burden of disease is extremely small, and you'll, you'll see why. Um, so the majority of the share of the DALI uh, due to mental disorders is due to its impact on years lived with disability. And you can see on the slide in this infographic, um, the blue section is the overall proportion uh, attributable to non-communicable diseases, and as you can see, a very big chunk of that is due to mental and neurological conditions. But what is missing in that infographic is visible here, and that is that most mental, neurological, and substance use disorders have their onset in youth. And it is because of this particular epidemiological characteristic of these conditions and the fact that they often have a chronic or relapsing course that really explains why these conditions uh, account for such a large share of the global burden of disease. Indeed, in the age group of 15 to 29, suicide is now the leading cause of death in most countries, including the one I live and work in in India. And mental disorders and substance use disorders together account for between a third uh, to nearly a half of the total burden of disease, depending on which region of the world you're in. So this is a staggering uh, 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 loss of productivity and health in potentially the economically most important demographic in any country. I'll finish with this slide and then hand over Maria Elena. In this slide is a very important finding and a, and a new set of analyses we carried out for the global burden of disease. Here you see uh, the traditional way in which years of life lost are, are calculated, and that's in the first column, the core specific deaths. So these are the deaths that are directly attributable to a particular disease condition um, in the GBD. And of course, as you can see lower down on the slide, uh, nobody ever dies of depression, although I guess some of us think we probably might. Um, in fact, the death certificate of someone who even commits suicide will never say the cause of death was depression. The cause of death will be suicide. So the net result is that the years of life lost due to depression is zero, similarly for bipolar disorder and so on. So in these analyses, we did a somewhat different way of calculating uh, 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 the deaths that could be attributable to mental disorders, and this was by looking at excess mortality in people uh, with a particular disorder as compared to the general population. And when you do that, you can see that the total number of excess deaths that would occur, for example, in people with depression is quite staggering, more than 2 million excess deaths uh, in these this analyses in the year 2010 in depression alone. And you can also see uh, a number number of other conditions with very large numbers of deaths uh, that would have, uh, not have occurred had the person not had that particular condition. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Maria Elena, who's going to take us through the priority interventions. Thank you, Vikram. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the invitation. So I will be continue uh, showing you what are the priority interventions, but also how and where should these priority interventions be delivered in order to make a change. The, what we evaluate with the evaluated intervention by categorizing interventions by strength of the evidence, uh, by strength of the evidence, by function, and by delivery platform. And uh, as you will see in the interventions, I will show you some examples. Uh, the best practices is when evidence of cost effectiveness, at least in a high income country, is available. Um, we have uh, in this platform interventions in different channels. One is population, what, and, uh, population. this means that universal pro uh, prevention and health promotion interventions will be there just as legislation and information and awareness. Community level, that include different uh, uh, places in the community, like workplace, school, or the community itself. And this will be selective prevention and health promotion, and then the health care targeted for secondary prevention and the tertiary care here for a specialist. And this would be uh, examples. I'm just going to be showing you uh, two examples of how the evidence was uh, collected and 
placed in these um, different uh, areas of like self-care and management, primary care, first level hospital and specialized care. This one is specific for alcohol and drug use disorders. Uh, you will see in red, these are the um, urgent interventions. Blue are those that uh, need continuous care. Uh, the black, this is the routine care we should be providing. And when it is bold, we are talking about uh, best practice, that we have evidence of best practice uh, in uh, some uh, develop con developing countries, but also in, de in the developed world. And we'll see that for uh, self-care, um, we will be safe monitoring of, of substance abuse. And this has been, these interventions have been assessed using the GRADE uh, procedure. So we have the um, summary of um, best practices uh, for the population platform. So all the different interventions are put in the book according to this example that I just gave you. The summary of best practices, including the population platform, the uh, policy and legislative measures to control the availability and demand of alcohol, and the best practices we uh, found that were excess exercise taxes. Um, the ones that had the best, uh, um, the best uh, results, also advertising bans. Uh, for legislative measures in relation to suicide, for instance, is the sale and distribution of pesticides as a means of reducing the risk for suicide, and this has been shown in developed and developing countries. Uh, the community platform uh, includes uh, interventions like life skills training in schools, to build social and emotional competencies. And uh, for the healthcare platform, we have a, a, a big variety of interventions like psychological treatment for mood anxiety, attention deficit disorders and disruptive behavior disorders among children, diagnosis and management of depression, including maternal depression, which is quite important for the development of the child and anxiety disorders. Continuing care of schizophrenia and bipolar disorders self-managed treatment of migraine, diagnosis and manage, management of epilepsy and headaches, intervention to support caregivers for patients um, and with dementia, and screening and brief interventions for alcohol use disorders, and finally opioid substance therapy, like methadone or buprenorphine for opioid dependence. Uh, and you will see in the book uh, the examples of how, um, these, how they were tested, where they were tested, and uh, the evidence also for LAMI countries. Uh, but uh, what the book went uh, one step farther because we thought that it was not enough to talk about cost-effective interventions and also the daily averted for each uh, dollar uh, spent, but also to let politicians and policy makers uh, to know how much money the, each intervention costed and um, this is what uh, we found, that uh, this, uh, the uh, cost of scale up package, package of prioritized intervention was estimated to be three to four US dollars per capita per year in the low and lower middle income countries and at least a double in upper middle income countries. Also, we found that this, um, the budget had not to be allocated uh, uh, at the same time, but it could be scaled by year, and we show that in the book. And also, uh, we find that the extended cost-effective analysis shows that policy moving towards universal public uh, finance that we have talked a lot about in this conference can lead to a more equitable allocation of resources across the income groups, and it is very obvious that the lowest income groups benefit the most of these interventions, so uh, this, I think, is a good, uh, good message for uh, the policy makers. Thank you very much. I'll just finish off with just some of the key messages uh, from the DCP3 volume and some examples of actions that are being taken uh, to address uh, some of those recommendations. So the first key message really is that the burden of these disorders, clunkily called MNS disorders, is large and it's growing in all regions of the world, um, and that the burden on mortality has been historically greatly underestimated. Secondly, that there's an array of effective and cost-effective interventions for the prevention, treatment, and care of these disorders, and these are ripe for scaling up both through 
population as well as community and healthcare platforms. And finally, that the public financing of this scaling up is not only affordable uh, in all countries of the world, but it also greatly increases financial protection, in particular for the poorest. So the question really is, how much impact has this kind of evidence actually had on development assistance for mental health? Last year, we published a paper that really examined what was the absolute amount and the proportion of the development assistance for health, which is the assistance given by high-income countries to the poorest countries of the world towards health sector reform uh, that could be allocated to mental health. And this is what we found. Uh, this chart shows you the absolute amounts as well as the proportion of the total that was allocated to mental health from the year 2007 to 2012, and you will see a nice jump from 2007 to really more than a doubling or nearly a tripling of the absolute amounts. Um, the year 2007 was quite a watershed. It was the year when The Lancet published its first series on global mental health. However, what's equally important to note is the red line, uh, which shows you that at no point during these five years has the proportion allocated to mental health ever exceeded 1% uh, of the total development assistance to health. It's also important to note that there has been a gradual decline with time, and that a very large proportion of this development assistance actually doesn't go to general health system strengthening for mental health, but very specifically to humanitarian crises, which of course are very important, uh, but typically don't, they don't necessarily strengthen the health system from a long-term perspective. So the key actions really, we, what we need is, in spite of all the evidence that we have and the very low investment in mental health care, is that we continue to need to engage national and global policymakers to invest in scaling up these evidence-based interventions. Clearly, there's a continuing need for implementation research. While we have a many effective interventions, we have less knowledge on how these can be integrated within routine healthcare platforms. And I think a particular opportunity lies ahead uh, in integrating with non-communicable diseases, other chronic conditions. And finally, we need to learn, I think, from the HIV AIDS movement, as we heard wonderfully in yesterday's lectures, uh, on how uh, civil society, particularly uh, groups of people affected by, uh, by a particular health condition, mental disorders in this case, can be mobilized to become more effective advocates uh, for, for their cause. So just some quick examples of each of these actions. In India, for example, last year the country launched its first national mental health policy armed as well with substantial new financial resources for a new district mental health program that really uh, actually does build on some of the recommendations of the DCP3 and a new mental health care bill that enshrines a right uh, to non-coercive treatment. Just last year, the Sustainable Development Goals were released. I'm sure many of you have been following that. That's a cross-cutting theme of this particular conference. And the great news was that in the declaration of the preamble, uh, mental health and more specifically mental disorders were specifically mentioned in two different uh, uh, parts of the preamble, especially most importantly uh, where it talks about universal health coverage. And in the specific health goal, um, two of the targets are specifically mentioning mental health. And these are all things to celebrate because, of course, mental health uh, were completely absent in the millenn Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and, and target 3.8, uh, of course, uh, doesn't explicitly mention mental health, but it doesn't explicitly mention any particular health condition. Uh, implicit, of course, uh, if you go back to the preamble, is the idea that universal health coverage must address both mental and physical health conditions. Prime is one example of a program that I'm associated with, uh, funded by the UK government, that is seeking uh, really to carry out implementation research, uh, that is to say, research that is uh, seeking to integrate evidence-based packages of care within routine healthcare systems in five countries, three in Africa and two in Asia. Here is another example of the sorts of integration research that is being carried out. Uh, this is a uh, research program funded by the Wellcome Trust in which uh, um, the care for diabetes, hypertension, depression, and alcohol use disorders is being integrated in routine primary health care by using mobile decision support systems. You can hear much more about some of those innovations. I'm not going to say really anything about uh, this network uh, that Carly will talk about in a moment that really documents the hundreds of innovations of this kind that people are uh, carrying out in a variety of different settings seeking to integrate mental health care and routine health care settings. Finally, the area of empowerment of people affected by mental illness. Here is one example of a global coalition uh, called the Movement of Global Mental Health, uh, which is a Really, it's, it's, a, it's a shared platform for people with mental health problems, their families, and professionals to stand, as it were, shoulder to shoulder 
uh, to really call for action uh, with a united voice uh, to policymakers to implement uh, evidence-based interventions. This is the, my last slide, which really is uh, um, an excerpt from Minister Binaguaho's uh, introduction to the DCP3 volume. I'll let you read this. Uh, and as you can see here, coming from a Minister of Health, exactly the kind of words that we would look for uh, to support the integration, to support the financing of mental health care and its integration in routine healthcare systems. Uh, lots of different people to acknowledge for the DCP3, as you can see on this slide. And for those of you who want more information, please do visit this website where, as I said, you can also download uh, the entire DCP3 volume. Thank you very much. All right, good morning. Um, pleasure to be here, even though I'm pinch hitting for Peter, um, who's terribly sad he couldn't make it. Um, this is one of his favorite events, and so uh, he was uh, gutted that he was called away by um, our major funder, the Government of Canada, um, to be with them today. Um, but I'm pleased to be here in his stead, um, and pleased to be on this esteemed panel um, that I think is really giving you a great overview of um, this momentum that is building in uh, global mental health at the moment. And what I'm here today to do is to really um, dive a little bit, give you a bit of a flavor of the um, grand challenge we've been dealing with at, um, at Grand Challenges Canada um, for the past five, six years now. Um, and this is um, one of our targeted challenges um, that has been a priority since we started in 2010. And this is um, focused on this problem that, um, that was just well laid out of this idea that um, mental health is, is something that has been underinvested in, um, but is fundamentally important to all realms of our health and well-being. Um, and I'm thrilled to see it in the sustainable development goals, um, not only for the specific um, improvements for people with uh, mental illness, but also for the, um, the lasting uh, trickle-on effect that it's going to have um, to, other, to us achieving other um, targets within that um, sustainable development goal um, agenda. This is something that I think has been um, underappreciated. Many of us in the, in the know of this um, see it and go, well, of course, there's links to all these other um, areas of health. Um, but I think in the next five, 10 years, this is where the rest of the world is going to wake up and realize without dealing with mental health, we are going to have very little progress against any of the, those other ambitious targets that have been set. Um, this is how we articulate the main challenge that we've um, been sourcing innovations against. So this idea that there's a massive burden, that most of it is in low and middle income countries that have a shortage of the trained professionals and resources um, that we've come to rely on um, trying to manage this, these conditions in, in high income countries. Um, and also layered on that is this widespread stigmatization stigmatization that exists um, all over the world, but really acutely in some um, cultural contexts where um, mental illness is, is, um, is actually uh, seen as something that um, needs to be treated by all other means or addressed by all other means other than um, by something that actually can make it better. Um, we definitely riffed off of the great work of those who put together the grand challenges in global mental health um, and took a cluster of those challenges um, under the heading of to improve treatments and expand access to care uh, for people living with mental disorders. Um, and this is really focused on um, a lot of the different challenges that have been um, talked about, uh, the idea of, of going into community-based care, um, care for adolescents, that, that critical time period where we're seeing huge burden of, of the disease, as well as increasing supplies of medication where that makes sense and um, benefiting from the advances in technology, um, again, where that can accelerate our progress. Um, We've been lucky to work with uh, the leaders in the field, so saw all this coming and um, have aligned our work with the Mental Health Action Plan um, that the WHO launched that goes out to 2020, and then now the Sustainable Development Goals out to 2030. And um, both of these really, that idea of increasing the access to care for individuals living with mental health um, conditions is um, central to both of those, um, those agendas. To date, we've funded um, over 70 projects in 28 different 
countries through um, competitive calls for proposals. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our work, um, across the Grand Challenges, we tend to um, invest in lots of early stage, bold ideas um, at a seed grant level um, so that people can test out their idea and see if it's got traction. And then we fund the most promising those, of those as they transition to scale. Um, and then our, we're, we're not in the kind of five to $10 million needs um, for, for seeing um, really big scale. And our whole mandate is to try and partner with those um, who are going to be the ones that further the scale and sustainability of any of these promising innovations as they go to scale. As Vikram mentioned, mentioned a fundamental part of um, what we've funded since we began was the Mental Health Innovation Network. And um, I urge all of you, if you haven't already, to go to their website. Um, they have a phenomenal database of all the innovations um, in mental health that are being tested um, with a great categorization of where they're at in that testing, um, what their needs are, and what we can anticipate into the future. Um, and this is also something they've, they've been helping us, um, this, this group at the London School and the WHO, in really trying to track what has been our impact um, against this grand challenge. And so to date, um, to summarize it, we've just come off of a portfolio review um, to take a snapshot of where we're at as our initial funds are, are um, running out at the end of this year and wanted to see really has, this, um, has our attempts to invest money in this space been worth it? Um, I would say, say from our internal look as well as that from our advisors um, that the answer is a resounding yes, but I just want to take a few um, moments to walk you through some of the proof points um, that, that makes us say that. Um, the first is that uh, this is our very complicated um, theory of change. Don't worry about looking at all of it, but really what this is doing, those bubbles are tracking some of the key components along that theory of change that we think needs to happen in order for these innovations to actually have widespread impact at scale. And you can see some of the significant numbers that we're starting to see, even though this is innovation, and this is innovation, or sorry, an innovation is likely to have timelines that are out to um, have impact in 10, 15 years from now. Um, at the same time, within these five years, we're starting to see some significant impact in this space. So the idea that hundreds of thousands of people are being screened um, for mental health conditions all over the world, um, that we're seeing millions that are being accessed to um, having access to awareness building um, activities, as well as um, tens of thousands of people accessing treatment. And as you see, we've got a little bit of the um, you know, portfolio management time lag between that big bubble that has 36 projects feeding into it and the little bubble that has 19 projects feeding into it. Um, but all those projects are finishing this year, and so we anticipate that measured um, improvement on lives um, uh, of those affected with mental health conditions um, to go up as the year um, uh, comes to the end. One of, it, one of our examples um, that we love to talk about, because it embodies a lot of the things we're trying to seek, is this one of um, Friendship Bench that's led by Dixon Chibanda in, in um, Zimbabwe. Um, and this is really dealing with the context that is very similar across low and middle income countries of a treatment gap that is over 90% for those in community settings um, to reach mental health conditions. Um, and so Dixon, um, from, from support from many others over the years, um, started this idea of actually having a physical bench outside of um, a, a community health care settings, or, or, or clinics, sorry, um, and that um, having lay health care workers um, sitting on that bench as grandmothers and actually um, uh, sitting and listening to the people who are coming in and referred to that bench um, and take them through a, a brief task-shifted cognitive behavioral therapy intervention um, that is seeing measurable improvements in um, people's health and functioning. Um, we're thrilled to be supporting Dixon as he scales this up from beyond the uh, initial scope in, in Harare to 52 um, different clinics in um, three cities in, in Zimbabwe. Um, and he has the support of municipal governments within Zimbabwe that are going to um, make this critically um, this critical jump towards a sustainable um, uh, long-term play with this approach. And we're particularly excited about this because if he's able to do this and actually show that he can scale this up in these large urban settings within um, Zimbabwe, then essentially we're starting to see this real glimmer of hope um, that these um, interventions actually can feasibly be rolled out in the context where they're most needed at the moment. 
Um, in terms of some of the other signals of, of uh, progress, we've had some impressive policy changes that have come as a result of the um, innovations we've funded. Um, fluoxetine um, now being available in both Malawi and Tanzania, either through um, assured uh, procurement or um, additions to the essential medicines list has been a fundamental um, impact from the Farm Radio um, International Group. Um, and then we've also seen um, some other essential medicines lists um, amended to actually in in include mental health treatment um, in Rwanda. And then also some um, exciting uh, advances to curriculum for um, healthcare professionals across the spectrum um, who can actually be exposed to um, some of these interventions that can actually make a massive difference in um, the lives of people living with, um, with mental conditions who present at um, primary care clinics. Um, one of the ways also to track kind of this desire for governments to be engaged in this is, is um, how much they're engaged in these innovations that we've been funding. Um, our, our goal is to have them actually put new cash in beside us as we're funding things that transition to scale. Um, we're actually starting to see pickup in that, which um, many said, that's a great idea, but uh, good luck with that. And so we're actually seeing that, um, that governments understand they've signed on to action plans that kind of mandate them to do this and are a bit lost as to how exactly to um, operationalize it. And so I think when they're seeing some evidence-based um, uh, um, uh, models that actually can be rolled out, developed and rolled out in their own context, they're actually starting to be um, uh, positive buyers of this. So some, uh, some really good examples of that is in Vietnam um, with the Minister of um, Labor and Social Affairs and in Kenya, um, the governor of Makawini County has actually put a recurring line item for $700,000 per year for mental health in that, in that uh, county. Um, and finally, we're, we've been thrilled to support the um, next leaders in mental health, and that has been um, acknowledged by others who um, I think are using a little bit us to, uh, to um, urge some others to put some more funding in, which I'm all for. So I'm glad to be an example and I'm really proud that the actual um, investment that we've made, although quite um, uh, modest compared to, uh, to some of the other areas in mental health, has actually had the impact it has in the next five years. And we are um, working very hard that we can stay around um, for the next five years so that these innovations can actually have um, a longer term run runway with us as well. And finally, I think um, as Vic ended as well, this, um, we, we can get lost in these um, ideas of these huge number crunching exercises and the economic um, outputs of it. And it's so, those are so critical for some audiences. Um, but I think just as critical are these individual stories. Um, and, and I think that idea of how much um, being able to treat mental illness in, um, in community settings uh, is, is fundamental to us achieving sustainable development is really best illustrated by the woman who's um, hugging Peter in that right-hand corner. She's in Haiti and spent about 30 years um, uh, with untreated epilepsy, um, which she spent um, essentially bankrupt herself um, time and time again, seeking um, some care from, from uh, traditional healers and such that just wasn't, wasn't coming to any sort of fruition for her. Um, she was caught by a project that's run by uh, Zamni Lasante, the Partners in Health um, work in Haiti. Um, one of their uh, community leaders is um, a pastor, and this woman had a seizure in the church, and um, the pastor kind of spoke to her afterwards and said, I think we actually might be able to help you. She's been treated for um, her epilepsy for the last two years and has been seizure-free since. And the absolute joy on her face when she talks about um, that being free of those seizures and what it's allowed her to do in terms of restarting her own business and actually being able to build on it for the first time in her life was absolutely moving. So um, I keep trying to go back to those types of stories every time I look at it. And, um, and I hope that's the kind of thing that can fuel all of us as we go forward with this. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted as well to be on the panel with my esteemed colleagues. I'm coming from Washington, D.C., from the National Institutes of Health, and you've heard each person talk about essentially the question of how do we reduce the burden of mental disorders? What do we need to do? We've had examples of how DCP3 is working to do this by making the economic case for the non-mental health audience to invest. We've heard from Carly Silver how Grand Challenges Canada is doing this work of really getting at the needs for treatment and treatment access through research. So I'm gonna emphasize that research is the tool that we use to both learn how to implement what's readily available and what's readily available we know now are evidence-based interventions that have been tested in a, multiple, in, in a multiplicity of contexts that can actually improve people's mental health status. But we, but we still need more. We still don't fully understand the etiology of mental disorders. We don't fully understand how to prevent these disorders, uh, multiple disorders. And for that, we need a longer effort of research as well. And I'm gonna talk a bit about these. So we've talked about the, we've talked about depressive disorders, psychotic disorders. These are what we, these are what we see in the people that come to clinics. But we know something about the etiology of these disorders. At least we know about risk factors. We know that genes play a role, that family history plays a role, that exposure to early life adversity plays a role, immigration experiences, other social experiences, loss. Those are the distal distal causes or distal risk factors, but they're also proximal causes, and we don't fully understand how social experience, exactly how genes um, confer risk. And this middle section is an area where we still have question marks that require research investment. And I wanna remind you that, of course, global mental health research is an integral part of the global health system, as is all research. And the global health system operates by first setting an agenda, allocating resources, using research to develop new interventions, and then of course we implement and deliver those services, and finally monitor, evaluate, and learn from them. The global mental health community has, has actually come together to set an agenda in multiple ways. The World Mental Health um, Action Plan that WHO has launched, the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health is an initiative that many of us and some of you are also involved in to identify those challenges that, if addressed within the next 10 years, could substantially reduce the burden of mental disorders in people around the world. Um, allocating resources, Grand Challenges Canada, the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, other funders around the world have invested resources to to help to solve these problems. So we're on our way. And this, of course, investing resources in, in uh, research is exactly what NIH does. So for those of you who are not from the US and for the students in the room, I just wanna remind you that the National Institutes of Health um, is part of the US Department of Health and Human Services, and it's the nation's largest medical research agency. We're the leading supporter of medical research in the world. NIMH is one of the 27 institutes that makes up the National Institutes of Health. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what my office at the National Institute of Mental Health does. We're the Office for Research on Disparities and Global Mental Health. We focus on a range of issues, but I think the best way to think of our work is we think about how can research be utilized to solve disparities in mental health status and care, both locally and globally. So we focus on rural mental health research, uh, women's mental health research issues, equity and disparities research in the United States, global mental health research, and research capacity building to diversify the scientific workforce. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the work that we do specifically in our global mental health program. These are some of the directions that we have, uh, we've chosen to pursue aligning with the priorities that have been uh, distilled in many of the priority setting exercises. Number one, which I think is true across all of NIH, is scientific opportunity. So solving these tough problems, both the immediate problems around implementation science, but the longer haul problems around understanding the etiology and mechanism of disorders, solving these with the best research, no matter where it comes from. Focusing on equity, my office specifically has been investing in research to address the treatment gap 
in low and middle income countries, um, figuring out the best interventions that enable us to do this. We also want to anticipate and respond to global public health trends, and these include the demographic and epidemiologic transitions that are leading to a greater burden of non-communicable diseases around the world. So what's the, what's the impact on mental health needs and mental health status for those? And that actually feeds into the next one, which is really making the case for integrating mental health into global health platforms of care. We've had plenty of investment in uh, many areas of global health, maternal child health, HIV care, and, those, and, and I think what we can learn as a mental health community from those investments is that targeted investments with, with stated goals enables people to move to those targets and achieve those targets. But many of those targets can't adequately be achieved without thinking about the mental health needs of people um, with HIV, of mothers as they're giving birth, of families as they're seeking to have healthy lives. Uh, and finally, our fifth effort is around supporting research capacity building in global mental health. And that has meant both creating a pathway for investigators in the United States who want to try to answer these questions, but also helping to build capacity for those collaborators that they will be working with in other parts of the world who want to ask these questions and answer them in their own settings. Since 2011, when we first started funding um, specifically from the Office for Research on uh, Disparities in Global Mental Health, we've committed about 41 million US dollars to investment in research and research training related to low and middle income countries. And today I'm gonna focus on research capacity building efforts and the models that we've been engaging to build research capacity in low and middle income countries. And I have to acknowledge that one of our major partners in this is the Fogarty International Center. Um, the Fogarty International Center uh, has one particular program that I wanna just give a shout out to, which is the Global Brain Disorders uh, Program, which has been in action for more than a decade. NIMH collaborates with that program to fund research that's relevant to our, our priorities. And this is just a sample of a few studies focusing specifically on the area of psychosis that we've supported in the last, uh, since 2011. But what's also important about those studies is that they're asking research questions, but they're also created specifically to build partnerships that strengthen research capacity in low and, with low and middle income country partners. And the trajectory of these projects is such that people start with a two-year grant where they're able to build their collaboration, focus on the research, and they can move on to an R01 or a five-year independent research grant, giving the partners um, in the lower middle income country setting a chance to take the lead on this research. So this is, some of, this is one of the models of research capacity building that we're very excited about and that we've had a significant investment in over the last few years. I'll also talk about our office's very first initiative in global mental health research, which is moving away from those long-term problems around etiology and mechanisms, but focusing on how do we get at the immediate problems of reducing the treatment gap in low and middle income countries. We began funding the collaborative hubs for international research in mental health in 2011, 12, and 13, and funded five collaborative hubs. And I'll tell you a little bit about what these hubs uh, represent. First, we have the Latin, Latin American Mental Health Hub in Brazil, Chile, Guatemala, Colombia, and Ecuador. The Ready Americas, or Regional Network for Mental Health Research in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, and uh, the US. And you can see there are two Sub-Saharan African hubs, the Partnership for Mental Health and Development, as well as the African focus on intervention research for mental health. Um, one in focusing on West Africa with Nigeria and Ghana, then Kenya, South Africa, and Liberia. The other, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Uganda. And we have the South Asian Hub for Advocacy, Research, and Education uh, with activities both for research and research capacity building in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And we're happy to have one of the PIs of that one, and Vikram, here with us today. But these hubs were meant to do three things. First of all, 
to demonstrate how to build the evidence base around task sharing or the provision of mental health services by less specialized providers, but the provision of evidence-based interventions in a variety of health systems. And, uh, you know, so we've got, in this group, we have low-income, lower-middle-income, and upper-middle-income countries. So that was their first task, was actually to, to conduct research in that area. Their, their second major task was the, in, the effort around collaboration. We asked them that they would bring the end users of research into this work from the very beginning. So engaging uh, people from the ministries of health, engaging service users, engaging clinicians for whom this work would be relevant as part of the research team as they articulated their research questions and conducted the research. But we also asked them to build research capacity, not just for their institution, but for the region. So each of these projects uh, offers opportunities for research training whether that be in the form of short courses, in the form of pre- or postdoctoral fellowships or master's programs, those are offered to people within their hub, but also to people outside of those countries in these hubs. So that's been a very exciting uh, program for us that has also helped to contribute to research capacity building. I want to highlight, though, as well, that over the last few years, we've seen new pathways that didn't exist before for training non-US investigators in low and middle income countries. And this now is a pathway that one could enter as a pre-doctoral trainee, moving all the way through to become an independent researcher. So again, I want to acknowledge the Fogarty International Center for many of these programs, which we then help to support. So the Global Health Program for Fellows and Scholars enables younger scholars to, to enter into global health to get research experiences, actually both US and non-US. Um, from then, one could theoretically move into one of the training programs that are offered by the collaborative hubs for international research and mental health, and moving on to training programs that are uh, institutional training programs in low and middle income countries, which uh, there, have, there have been several of those, and that's what, these, that's what the D43 represents. And we've been really excited as well about the, a new K Award. And I don't know if how many people know what K Awards are, but these are individual awards that allow young faculty members to develop into independent, independent researchers by having a specialized time set apart to focus on research. Um, and finally, one could move from there into certainly applying for independent funding through any program, but the global brain and nervous system disorders is just one example. Oops, sorry. And these three um, in the middle, at least the ones that we've been involved in, the uh, non-communicable diseases across the lifespan, the medical education partnership initiative, uh, the second iteration, and the K43 Emerging Leaders Research Program are new. So they've created new opportunities for young investigators. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of the institutional training programs that we've been able to support over the last few years in China, in Southeast Asia, again in China and Egypt and India, focusing on, uh, on uh, schizophrenia research, implementation science training in Mozambique, uh, work focusing on developmental disorder, something that we don't see a lot of in low and middle income countries. It's happening in Turkey and Azerbaijan and the newly independent states. Um, interesting work on the socioeconomics of mental health, actually training people to be able to do some of this work that's relevant to DCP3 in Southeast Asia, I mean Southeast Europe, sorry about that, in Romania and Bulgaria and other, uh, other countries in that region. Finally, addressing mental and physical comorbidities in migrants and their families. Uh, this is developing uh, young investigators in Kosovo and Tajikistan. Uh, UCLA has got a program training South African researchers to focus on trauma research. And we are also touching on neuro neuroscience, getting neuropsychiatry and behavioral disorders training and actually focusing on indigenous communities in Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru, and Argentina. So this is just an example of some of those efforts to train uh, non-US investigators. But what's really exciting is that all of these programs work together and they create wonderful infrastructure to leverage opportunities for building research capacity. So what we found is that uh, 
entering people entering the Global Fellows and Scholars Program have often then had uh, collaborative experiences with some of our with some of our NIMH hubs. They then get independent research training in the global brain disorders. Um, many nice collaborative relationships have developed here, and this is something that we hadn't seen certainly at NIMH uh, before. And you know, this is all this has all arisen in the last five years. We're particularly excited about the new medical education partnership initiative where we're also supporting research training in these countries, in Kenya, Ethiopia, continuing wonderful work in Zimbabwe, um, South Africa, University of KwaZulu-Natal, and Mbarara University in Uganda. But I, what also is close to my heart, however, is building a pathway for those young investigators in the US who have been trying to figure out how do you do global mental health. Like, can you, actually, can you actually survive doing this kind of work? And um, believe it or not, it's true. When we started, uh, you know, when, when ORDGMH, the office was established in 2010, and these, there, were, there were question marks in those two middle squares. Uh, the Fogarty program existed, their uh, brain disorders program existed, but we didn't have anything at NIMH to really bridge that gap for people wanting to get adequate training to begin to um, move towards independence. Since that time, we've, we are supporting now four institutional training grants in the United States, um, at UCLA, at uh, Mass General, at Johns Hopkins, and at Columbia University, I think that was four, um, that are enabling people to, to train in global mental health, both pre-docs and post-docs, depending on the program. And now you can move on to a Global K Award. We established a Global Mental Health K Award really to stimulate the field and let people know this is an option, which uh, we've, been, we've been seeing some response to. And again, those young trainees can then move on to more independent research opportunities. So what do we need to think about as we build a new generation of mental health researchers? I think, first of all, something that none of us talked about much today is we actually have to build, we have to continue to build a generation of mental health care providers as well because the researchers around the world emerge from the providers who are actually delivering services and we know that in, on average, around the world there are only nine mental health workers per 100,000 population and there are vast, vast differences from the poorest countries to the wealthiest country. I believe there's one in 10 million psychiatrists, for example, in Afghanistan, and one in 5,000 in Belgium. So we still need to figure out how to build the mental health workforce, because from that workforce will emerge as well the mental health research workforce. But I think the time is now for us to train a new cadre of global mental health research that have skills for thinking globally, for thinking about how do we translate what we've learned from the friendship bench, for example, to other settings, whether that's another low-income setting or whether that's even an upper-middle-income setting. What do we need to know about health system environments? What do we need to understand about cultural context to be able to make those kinds of translate, make that kind of translation feasible? We also need to encourage our trainees, and this is what you who are, who are educating um, young future global health professionals should also think about is, how do we encourage trainees to gain the skills that will equip them to work with and communicate with key stakeholders who play a role in research uptake? Um, I think we have to communicate that publishing the paper is not the end goal that we have to move, the, the, the data need to be disseminated, everyone needs to know about that, but then we need to figure out how to move that to action. And people need to be equipped to do that. It's not something that you learn typically in a, in a medical program or a PhD program. Finally, we need to make sure that training opportunities for global mental health researchers encompass the entire range of mental health research. We need folks who are focusing on the services needs, the services demands in very poor settings, but we also need people who are thinking, continuing to think about how do we understand mental disorders, their root causes, and create the science coming from multiple populations that help us to answer those questions. Thank you. This is my email. If anyone has questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we can open the floor to questions. And I'll just stay here in case I need to repeat any questions for, for those. 
asking. Uh, should I start? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Casey Fisher. I go to Toro University. I'm getting my MPH. Um, I'm actually moving to China next year for my internship to work in a prevention center for mental health at a university. And one of the things I've noticed is that stigma is a huge problem and a huge burden on people trying to get help, but they don't because of that stigma. So I guess I'm wondering what is being done specifically in India, which has a high stigma as well, um, compared to most countries like the US and, and Europe, what is being done to sort of reduce that stigma long term? OK, th uh, thanks for that question about stigma. Um, so first of all, I have a slightly uh, different view on stigma. Um, first of all, I think stigma actually is a global phenomenon. Um, sometimes I see a lot more stigma about mental illness in the West than I actually see in developing countries. There are actually, paradoxically, more inclusive spaces for people with developmental disabilities and serious mental illness in many rural agrarian communities than there are in more industrialized urban communities. So I think we need to be moving away from this idea that stigma is not a problem in um, well, I think it's a global problem, actually. The second thing is I think a lot of stigma is produced by actually the nomenclature we use. It's actually imposed on society by a very biomedical worldview of mental illness. Uh, and I think that's another challenging and provocative thought. I think that my own strategy is very much and that of many people in global mental health, is to actually include the common understanding of mental health problems that prevails where you're working within the language of our research and the language in which we communicate rather than thrust a biomedical uh, nomenclature onto communities which is often alienating and actually quite scary for many people. Uh, having said all of that, that doesn't mean that stigma doesn't exist. It does exist. Uh, I think it exists across all levels of the health system. And there's a terrific review that was published in The Lancet a few weeks ago, which I'd urge you to look at, which looks at the evidence base on uh, interventions that address stigma. I have to say, the, in a nutshell, there isn't anything terribly um, compelling in terms of the evidence base. But the one thing that does stand out, uh, as it did with HIV AIDS, uh, is that leadership by people with mental illness, their active engagement in anti-stigma campaigns seems to be probably one of the most effective ways of addressing stigma. Jackie Wagner. I earned my MPH from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I actually have two questions, one of which you um, briefly answered, so if you'd like to add more, that would be great, um, about what consideration is there in the field around cross-cultural perspectives on mental health? Um, for example, in, in some parts of the world, in some cultures, uh, dissociative identity disorder has a totally different um, meaning and perception for people. Um, and the other question was about resilience programs. Um, of course, you know, we see these in, among populations in active conflict zones as well as um, in areas, even in the U.S., with a lot of community violence. Um, but what about using these programs more broadly in terms of building resilience um, rather than treating um, mental health problems once they occur? And um, your all's opinion on the utility and effectiveness of these types of programs. Is that a general question to the panel? Is there a specific person? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyone want to take that? I'll, I'll start with your question about um, cross-cultural awareness and sensitivity. I think that's 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 a big part of what the global mental health community is quite concerned with. And I want to say something from the funder perspective, which I think is interesting about this field and about at least maybe speaking for Carly and me. Um, We've been able to fund investigators who live in these contexts, who work in these contexts, who understand these contexts directly, who are able to, as they shape their research and ask their research questions, to do that with some understanding of what are the what are the cultural um, what are the cultural questions and how do we how do you navigate that those waters? So I, I think that's an important piece of this is making sure that we are enabling researchers who are coming from their particular settings, who know their culture, to ask questions about mental health and ask questions about the best solutions to, to mental health problems. Yeah, just to build on that, I mean, um, I think one of the things that has always struck me is this concept of, um, of a lot of the researchers who are working in 
cultures that actually don't even have a word for lots of the um, the conditions we're talking about. So this idea that um, you've got uh, Ethel, who's uh, who was also on that last um, slide that I showed, who is essentially fighting depression in um, Uganda, where there is no word for depression um, in the local languages. And so that concept is um, has to be navigated, but it doesn't mean that people aren't um, aren't kind of searching for something and, and feeling like there's um, there's uh, you know that same sort of sadness or or whatever they just have different words to uh, describe it and and uh, different roots into that conversation um, that I think is important I think the point on resilience is is amazing um, I think there's a lot to be done I think it was brought up a few times on the prevention side of things um, uh, I think a lot of the work we've been doing on the prevention side uh, lands in our saving brains. Um, pro program, which is really focused on early child development and formulating those um, healthy relationships and and, uh, and emotional um, development early on in life. And but I think, as Pamela said, we've got loads to learn on that um, still to come. Thank you. I um, your first question was by identity disorder or. Yeah, that's an, that's an important question. First, I want to tell you that in our research that we have been working with uh, 22 countries, we have found much more consistency across uh, mental health uh, disorders and also the way they manifest and um, how they affect. I mean, prevalence do vary, but the issues that are around the manifestation of the disorders are very similar. But then what do you do with that information? And coming back to the first question, as uh, considering uh, how people uh, define their own disorders or their own problems, I think I completely agree with Bikram that we are talking to people uh, with the concepts that we have, but not the concepts that they use. For instance, if they, we think that uh, a stigma is a very big barrier for mental health care, so they go and look for care. But then if you find out how they, did, how they conceptualize their own problems, so like if they have a problem in the family, like a child that is abusing drugs, that's the problem. They feel depressed as a, as a mother, as a consequence, but they will look for the, the help that they think they need. Or if the husband is uh, violent, they will go look for that uh, within the community to help, not the depression that is a consequence. So I think that we have to learn also, not only to understand the disorders, but the way to communicate with people and understand how they see the problems. And then we can go and use the, that information to really help close the treatment gap. So I think it's uh, not only global stigma, but the way also we, we address and behind stigma and the way we address the disorders is, is information. But there's certain disorders, like the one you mentioned, that we need to learn much more about that. And I mean, we, are, we think that this is not a disorder, but a condition, but that is linked to, many, to a lot of distress. So we are doing cross-cultural research within Mexico in communities that are, have different perspectives, but also in Brazil, in India, we're hoping that, that have different approaches to see how we can understand better that condition and then help better the people, not because of the condition, but because of the disorders that come with the condition because mainly of the social rejection and problems in that, of those issues. Um, hello, my name is Rand Vanderwall. Um, I worked a year and a half uh, at the Thai-Burma border in uh, the Burmese refugee camps. Uh, we had a mental health program that, you know, was very hard to fund, actually. Um, the thing that I noticed was that, uh, first, very few refugees would come directly to our mental health program. So we identified most uh, uh, people eligible for, you know, that program through our uh, primary health uh, uh, facilities. Um, the trend that we saw generally was that men uh, represented less uh, at our uh, primary health facilities and the men that were identified for our mental health program would just not show up um, for uh, our services there. So I would say that probably um, 
99% of our clientele were women. Whereas, you know, this, uh, in this context where you have refugees who, ha who have been confined uh, for, you know, more than 20 years in that place, um, which, you know, is a very emasculating environment, and uh, then you receive the women who, you know, are in the conditions that they are, because, you know, often because they're, you know, men, uh, they're, uh, boys are, you know, uh, abusing alcohol, drugs, um, uh, do, um, yeah, are participating in gang activities. You know, how do we reach the men and the boys? And then what do we do to um, address uh, their needs? That's for the whole panel, I assume. I don't know whether I, why I took it, maybe because I'm the man on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a great question because also I think the area, I, I'm going to focus on young men um, and boys. I think it's an important issue because um, more broadly the whole global adolescent health agenda has been primarily focused on young women's reproductive and sexual health and that's an extremely important area. But in doing so also young boys and men have been systematically excluded from programming and research. Uh, this is changing now. Um, there has been a significant change uh, in the agenda of global adolescent health. Uh, and I do see a lot more interest in trying to engage with young men and boys' uh, problems. For example, the risk of dying prematurely is much higher in young men than it is in young women. And this is a fact uh, that actually spans across all societies. And I think a key element here is uh, substance use. Um, and substance use, I'm sure Maria Elena will say something more from her experience in Mexico in this. Um, substance use, especially alcohol, uh, although of course the substances we tend to associate most as, as a bigger problem are narcotics, but actually in the developing world it's alcohol which is by far and away the most, most lethal of all the substances. And it's quite interesting how certainly in India, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the Th Thailand and Burma and other places as well, the model that is used to deal with alcohol at social policy level is actually that of a moral problem. Uh, not as a health problem. And I think that also then reflects on how resources are allocated towards drinking problems. It's uh, largely a policing, a, uh, a legal kind of approach rather than a harm reduction or a, or a public health informed approach. And I'll just end and give over to Maria Elena. It's interesting, in India, a day for yesterday, uh, India's largest state announced complete prohibition. Um, and if you look at the story behind the prohibition in that state, um, it was because women's groups uh, had made that a condition to actually vote for the winning political party, um, that they wanted to stop drinking. And if you look at what happened, there's an interesting story about this, because in the US, in the 1930s, this is exactly what happened, is that um, the political movement towards prohibition was fueled by women's uh, uh, groups. Um, and, uh, and it's quite interesting, the same thing is happening 50, 60 years later in many developing countries. Well, congratulations for that important work. I think it's one of the most um, hurting circumstances of this population you're working with, uh, that we have paid very little attention. And um, well, in Mexico it happens the same. I think that men get depressed, they suicide uh, more often than females. And we are always thinking about mental health linked to females, of course, the, with alcohol, drugs, and behavioral problems are more prevalent among men, but they do get uh, depression when you cross, uh, you can, uh, like only um, severe depression, or um, not only uh, the first episode, but the chronic uh, people that have already been in depression, then the main female rate diminishes dramatically and significantly and yet they don't go for treatment. And uh, maybe that's why they have all these alcohol problems in part because of the high comorbidity. So I think that you pointed as it's very well taken and we need to look for young male more. In Mexico, they not only die for alcohol, but also for homicides, the ones that are being killed more. And so they, the stress they're living is very high. So I completely agree with you and think we have to work more on that.
I just wanted to add that you know this is a this is a place where the mental health community might take a lesson from the HIV community, which has actually been doing a lot to try and engage men and uh, into care, and that often means not having a mental health clinic <laughs> where people have to show up for care and thinking about other ways of bringing those services out of the clinic but into the community. I mean, what else happens in the camp? Are there are there soccer games? Are there things that you can do where you can somehow get people? Um, not just focusing on their mental, their mental illness, but focusing on other needs that they have and use that as an opportunity to try and engage them around, around mental health care needs as well. Okay. Hello, my name is Kala Mehta, and I'm um, a faculty member at UCSF and also part of the WHO NIMHANS I Support team. Um, I'm interested, it's a very broad question to any of the panel members. Uh, what do you think is the particular role of internet-based and mHealth tools in the role of scaling mHealth, I mean, mental health interventions? Um, could you speak to that? If you could project into the future, what do you think is going to be the future role of these things, as particularly in the areas where there are not enough providers? Thank you. So I think it's a fabulous question. I think um, generally M Health um, in any realm is not something we've actually uh, really nailed yet, and I would say the same goes for uh, global mental health. Um, I I guess two things to say on this. One is that um, we're trying to ask this question in a little bit more of a evidence-based manner with the um, collection of, of um, projects that we have. Um, an is interesting finding at the first instance was that we had, I think it was um, somewhere in the range of about 27 projects of the 40-some um, of this initial anal analysis, so a, a quite a number that had some M Health component. Um, a lot of that had to do with screening or um, data collection. Mm -hmm. And we've actually found that actually during the implementation, about half of those have gone to a paper-based model. So there's, some, there's a flaw in that system that's making the gap between, um, between that intention and the um, end point. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe they're realizing there's areas that actually doesn't make sense, um, but we have to dig more into that. So stay tuned for that element of it. I think um, when it comes to scaling, there's a couple things out there. I, I do agree that there is a role for, um, for technology. I think there's some in um, Australia has a really great example um, of, I think it's, what's it, I'm blanking on the name of it at the moment, something about a wall, big white wall or something. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really good example of something that's, that's engaging um, more adolescents and things that, that, that could have um, some footing. We're exploring some um, within lower uh, resource communities um, in terms of really that scale element. And the, the challenge here is that um, to make those sustainable at the moment, um, that we are worried that it's actually not going to be hitting the, um, the people who are most vulnerable, the people who are most poor. So I think there are possibilities for this to be um, helping us reach kind of a, a lower middle income type of a family um, person in, in uh, low resource areas, but unlikely to hit the really impoverished. And I think we just have to be mindful of how that technology thing is actually potentially form, uh, bridging a, a gap um, that might be formed by uh, geography or things, um, a distance that might be formed by geography, but actually might be widening a, a other um, inequities that exist. So not an answer. I think it's a great question and I uh, hope we can learn a lot more about this. Well, I think it's a great question, and I think that, uh, I mean, coming for a developing country and a low-resource country, very, very, very low-resource country, uh, the, in relation to what is spent in mental health, uh, we have developed uh, internet intervention for females in the, that are depressed, mm -hmm. general depression and postpartum depression, and uh, trying to find out why they don't want to go to treatment and make them go to treatment if they have a severe depression, but help them with these life stresses and the problems they are facing with this uh, uh, low um, depression, low level of depression. And it has worked very, very well. People go to it, uh, many, many quotes. Uh, many people remain once they start. And what has been very interesting is that it is a female-oriented intervention, and it was like, uh, being a female is 
that hard? Is that hard being a female or something? That would be the, the, the title. And, but we have 10% of men coming into the program and taking the program. So it is something that they feel it can help them, even though it is very female oriented. So that really uh, taught us that we need to go and do the same for men. And I think that that diminishes the problem of many females uh, that have to take care of children, don't go to our treatment for men, maybe much more in the stigma side. And we have more examples on alcohol. And certainly this is one of the main, so the basis for the platform that Bikran developed for this group, for this book, is the uh, community interventions. And, 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 and these type of interventions are a main issue. I'll just say quickly that, you know, I, I'm very, I, I think that that is the future of the field. Uh, and I think uh, mobile and digital platforms are, uh, there are early days for them, but there's no question in my mind that that's the future. They're the future both in terms of building capacity and competency in health, force, uh, health workforces, in quality assurance, in monitoring healthcare systems. Uh, so there's a whole piece of the digital technology world for the provider, but there's also the whole piece for the person with the problem. Uh, and in particular, self-care with or without guidance is, 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 is another parallel piece. But it is early days, as Carly mentioned, and it's an area of further investment and research. And I'll just add one last thing, because I think one of the questions is going to be, certainly on the, on the service user or patient end, is how, what's the, what is the interface between the person and the M, <laughs> or the internet, mm -hmm. and the interface between the person and another person? And how does one actually titrate that? I'm Sheila Davis. I'm the director of the Healthcare Leadership Program at the University of Denver. I'm interested in the integration of behavioral health and primary care and best practices. And I'd love, this question is addressed to the entire panel. I know you, you talked about the friendship bench, but could you say more about this? Um, I, th I think this is a, so, so the root of a lot of the um, community-based projects that we're funding um, is it's either one of pulling people into a system or it's one of engaging people for um, kind of problem-solving um, behavioral therapy type of um, intervention. So I'd say it's about 50-50 at the moment um, in terms of the approach that people are taking. Um, I think the, the questions that I have on that is, um, is the, uh, the behavioral components and how much more sustainable that might be for a person, an individual, rather than pulling them into um, uh, the primary care system or other systems that they're getting different types of um, treatment, uh, potentially drug-based treatments and such. Um, yeah, so I think it's, again, I think this is a question that we're still exploring um, through our own portfolio as to what is, what is um, showing the best um, value. And I think to me, it, lands on a sustainability um, of that individual's um, ability. Are they essentially a, a constant user of the system, or is it something that provides them a tool they're able to go out with? So that's, that would be my take on it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it's, an, it's a question that's relevant everywhere. Um, we're supporting a number of projects that are integrating mental health into different platforms, which not necessarily, some of which might be considered primary care in different contexts, so into maternal child health uh, contexts. And I think both Vikram and Maria Nena can, can speak to this. I think a lot of the challenges are around um, understanding the flow of a clinic, understanding how much providers can take on, figuring out what the best ways of um, continuing supervision to make that work. I think one of, our, one of the projects we're supporting in South Africa is training a group of health workers to manage multiple chronic conditions, including depression. And what they found was most effective, actually, was developing a change management intervention. I mean, that was even more, more important than the training of the actual providers to deliver the service, was equipping the entire system to know that this change is coming, <laughs> and what does this change mean for each of you and for your roles? So I, so I think thinking about what is it going to do to the system, what, is it gonna, what, it's, what are the implications going to be for providers, um, meeting their concerns about workload, their concerns about uh, maintaining the knowledge so that they actually feel competent to continue to deliver something that they're not accustomed to are all important questions. 
Great. Since we have about five minutes left, I just wanted to underscore a couple of points, especially for the students in the audience, and then we could take perhaps the last three questions as a group and use our remaining time. A um, couple of things I wanted to point out to make sure they didn't slip under people's radar. I know they were mentioned, but greater than half of the uh, years of life lost to disability in the world to mental illness are caused by depression and anxiety disorders. It's nothing exotic or scary or hopeless. It's something that we've all known how to treat for decades in high-income countries, and we're very adept at treating. It's curable. There's no reason those people can't be living normal lives. Um, the second that um, Vikram mentioned was uh, about the, the cost and the impact on other health care. Um, this is a really important point. So there's some data showing that, uh, in fact, if you compare having a mental illness to being a smoker, being obese, having high lipids, your health care costs will be higher, exclusive of the depression, uh, compared to if you had those other risk factors. So they dramatically increase health care costs. And a final economics note for those of you who are attuned to that, there is a 300% rate of return on treating depression. So there is, there is no reason from a health perspective, there is no reason from an economics perspective that we're not doing this. We simply have to get the processes in motion um, in, through the vehicles and the avenues and the pathways and concepts that you've heard discussed here. But let's just take the last three as a group and then we can answer. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sharon Talboys. I did my MPH at Emory University and my doctoral training at University of Utah. Um, I'm very interested in the intersection between gender disadvantage and mental health, primarily common mental disorders and suicide. My question uh, gets at data quality. So when we look at the countries where you see the highest female um, rates of suicide among um, female youth, they're also the countries that have poor data quality issues. So in my research at the local level, it's been fairly easy uh, to connect the dots, but when you look at cross-cultural comparisons, uh, much more difficult. Do you, uh, can you tell us about any planned investments in the improvement in suicide uh, surveillance? Great. Take the next question, please. Hi, my name is Joyce Saki, and I'm Dean for Global Health at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. And I guess I have two questions. The first question will be to the entire panel. And it has to do with an element of um, at least uh, what we know here in this country can be a source of depression, which is inadequate treatment of chronic pain. And I wonder if in all your work you can comment on how particularly in low to middle income countries where uh, I know that pain control has not been something that has been, has sort of taken sort of center uh, focus. I, I've been to countries where people with um, cancer, for instance, are suffering with inadequate control of their pain, and we know that that can lead to depression in and of itself. So I guess the question is um, how much of your work uh, is also tackling training or increasing capacity for effective pain control, particularly in those countries where there's also the dual burden of um, abuse of prescription drugs while at the same time there's inadequate treatment of pain. That, that's my first question. The second question perhaps has to, uh, is directed to Dr. Collins. I was delighted to hear you mention the need to not only diversify uh, the workforce, but actually do so in a way that actually makes sure that countries that don't have mental health providers do. And I know that in this country, we've engaged uh, in pipeline programs and student development programs where uh, you have to, in fact, engage students fairly early on in the educational system. Um, at Tufts, for instance, we have high school students, pre-med students, where we're literally bringing them to the medical school to expose them so that hopefully we can expand the pool of uh, students to actually even consider going into the healthcare field in the first place. And I wonder how much of this may be occurring in those countries uh, that you listed, Dr. Collins, in your, uh, in your uh, presentation. Hi, I'm Mark Sedler. I'm a psychiatrist uh, and dean of global health at Stony Brook University. Uh, you'll be glad to know this is an announcement, not another question. Uh, we've started, uh, launched the mental health interest group for CUGH just a couple of weeks ago. I'm the moderator. If you go, if you sign into the website, go under interest groups down to mental health, you'll see the, uh, the new website. Uh, and there's a section for interactive forums. Um, for posting of research papers, uh, for um, 
human resources, advocacy, and so on. And if you have any questions, my email address is posted and you can send them to me. Thank you. Okay, I see it's 10 o'clock now, so maybe for those of you who could stay a little bit, we'll, we'll go to 10.05 or so. I know there's just a break after. Very quickly, because we are finishing, I think that your question about pain management is very, very important. Um, as a matter of fact, there are global statistics that are based on the amount of uh, medication that countries ask the UN system for, uh, uh, for use within the country. So we know the amount of uh, under, um, under availability of these medications in many countries. As a matter of fact, uh, around uh, uh, most 90 more percent of the um, morphine type medications are consumed in the very rich countries and the poor countries we don't have that enough and there's been a big movement uh, to encourage uh, countries to uh, buy and get new medications and also train people for that and uh, I think we could uh, talk a lot about that because it is very related of course to depression and to other problems and then maybe at the end, if we you want, we can talk a little bit about what we're doing in Mexico. Uh, that is a very big change. Uh, but uh, I would like to give the microphone to my colleagues. But that's an important question. Um, I'll take the question on suicide surveillance. Um, I think that's, that is a very important issue, which makes the comparison of suicide rates across countries extremely difficult to interpret. Uh, is the rate higher in one place because it's better reporting, or is it because it's genuinely higher? And the other important thing about suicide reporting is that actually it reflects much more the method uh, that is being used. So it could be perfectly plausible as it is in many parts of the world that self-harm rates are actually very high, but rates of death are much lower, which is a good thing. But if you just simply compare suicide death rates between places, you might not actually be picking up, as it were, the base of the pyramid, uh, which is self-harm rates. I don't know anywhere in the world where there is actually a robust surveillance system, certainly not in the developing world, where uh, suicides are being accurately counted alongside self-harm rates. Uh, but I clearly think that is a very important goal, especially since one of the SDG indicators that reflect mental health is likely to be actually suicide. Yeah, I was just going to add, building on that point, the idea of, um, as the SDGs have now been um, free, has, we have a framework for that. The next part is really operationalizing that, and that's really where the rubber hits the road in terms of these surveillance elements and countries being able to actually um, map their own progress. So I think that's going to be the exciting progress in the in the years ahead. And and I think the real challenge there is to make sure that some of these um, you know really meaningful indicators for mental health are actually amongst the agendas at that country level. So I'll take the question about the pipeline. Um, if you're talking specifically about mental health training and a pipeline for, for that, I don't think there are many of those, but I will say that the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, um, the MEPI program that both NIH and PEPFAR supported and NIH continues to support, in its first round did a great deal for enhancing medical education uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, and there were certain specific programs that actually did have a focus on mental health. So University of Zimbabwe had a very nice program to both to introduce more training in uh, psychiatry in their medical school, that resulted in actually getting several more students moving into MMED programs and now actually a significant number of uh, faculty or of psychiatrists who are who have been developed over the last six years in, in Zimbabwe. So um, that's one example of a nice pipeline program, but certainly with respect to training mental health professionals and even training mental health researchers, we need to see more of that. Great. Please join me in thanking our group.